Last time on HMS Ark Royal. Captain has the ship. Slow ahead, both engines. We've got very poor visibility. Oh, the cups! It's a great honour to be the flagship of the Royal Navy for the Queen's Review. It's probably the worst type of flood that a ship can get into. <laughs> HMS Ark Royal is 50 kilometers off the east coast of the United States. And though no one on board knows it, this will turn out to be her final moment of glory on the world stage. The last international mission before she's decommissioned. But for the moment, she takes the limelight, leading a flotilla of British and US military power. The whole deployment, codenamed Auriga, has been building up to this final stage a massive war game with the US military due to last several weeks. There'll be no shore leave till it's over and Ark Royal's crew will be pushed to its limits. In charge of the entire deployment which is being commanded from Ark Royal is Commodore Simon Ancona. This is a large exercise which involves not only this task group based around Ark Royal, but an amphibious task group, HMS Ocean, HMS Albion, that sailed later than us and joins us across here in America. Together, we'll make a big eight-ship task group. And my job, based around Ark Royal and our task group, is to protect the other ships as we move south. And a bit like Russian dolls, once we get south off Amberland here, we'll be disgorging the amphibious task group to go ashore and do what they've been tasked to do in Amberland. The US East Coast has been divided into zones for the purpose of this exercise, with invented names. But the pressure on those taking part is all too real. The Marines have no idea what they'll be facing when they reach the shore. Ark Royal's mission is to ensure the safe landing of troops into a hostile territory so that humanitarian aid can be delivered. Over the coming days, the task force will be facing a series of challenging scenarios laid on by the US Navy. Our first task is to protect ourselves as we go down through this narrow strip between the eastern seaboard United States and this, this large fabricated island here. The smaller ships surrounding Ark are there to protect and support her as their flagship, all with different responsibilities. One of them is a Type 23 frigate, HMS Sutherland. Sutherland's got a vital role. Sutherland will be the runner. So every time there's a maritime interdiction, when we've got notification, there's a contact of specific interest for boarding or to go and uh, check out, if you like, or if we have to pulse her forward to fight submarines, you know, there's pretty much only one runner left, and that's Sutherland. I mean, she's going to be working very hard indeed. As the fleet heads south through the strait, HMS Sutherland speeds ahead. A suspicious vessel's been spotted on radar that could pose a threat to the task group. A kilo x-ray, this is India, over. Sutherland can be used for anti-ship or anti-submarine warfare. Her design makes her difficult to spot on radar. Her immediate role is to intercept the suspicious vessel before it's got a chance to get anywhere near Ark Royal and the rest of the task group. Got an updated PCS for the combatante. The ship they're headed for is an American training vessel posing as a trawler from a rogue state. OK, well, let's just classify her as Joker and continue telling me. Sutherland has been vectored into this area um, because we had the intelligence to suggest there was a, a contact of interest, a merchant vessel up here, which had been um, potentially smuggling narcotics, drugs, arms, people and is suspected of assisting the terrorist organisation that's um, at work out here. Red vessel, Sierra Romeo, Tango Mike. This is uh, Kurdish warship Foxtrot 81. For routine precaution, I intend to send my boarding team to carry out an inspection of your vessel in accordance with United Nations Security Council Resolution 1680. The trawler, five personnel on board, all speak English. She's a Cat B vessel, which means we can expect illicit cargo, weapons, narcotics, and contraband. So An armed boarding team prepares to leave Sutherland. Right, be aware, fellas, yeah, if it's a trawler, it's going to be slippy on the decks as we're walking round. 
Briefing the team is Chief Petty Officer Kevin McAllister. As soon as we get across there, up the ladder, professional from the way go. All right, be firm and polite with the crew. Let's get our job done. Let's get back over to Mother. Don't the bell. No, no, no. The Navy conducts hundreds of boardings every year. And training has evolved since the embarrassment caused by the capture of 15 sailors from HMS Cornwall by the Iranians in 2007. They were held for 13 days and then released. But for all the team's training, boarding the suspicious vessel when both are moving independently in heavy swell is difficult and dangerous. particular types of boardings, they happen every day in every ocean we patrol. Our, our goal here is to make it as realistic as possible, so when they do see it out there, they have an idea of how to deal with it. Uh, no external communications, uh, via chat, mobile phones, emails. Yeah, yeah, no problem. Okay. And finally, Sailors from the US Navy get into character. They even do the accents. How long are you staying with us today? I can't say. Um, we're just here uh, to conduct flag verification, um, check that what you are, what you say you are, basically. The reason we have a, a range of scenarios that we will uh, we will put in play for the different ships, and along the way, we'll we'll throw in some uh, stowaways, uh, damage control emergencies, things like that, to see how the crews react, so that we can uh, we can evaluate their their awareness and their ability to deal with these situations. The boarding party searches for anything suspicious. So, a laptop found. Excuse me, do you know anything about the uh, laptop that was found hidden behind a bit, Master? Uh, it's not working, it's, uh, it's broke, so I want to be done with it. Right, OK. Yeah. Have you got paperwork for the laptop that we can see? Yeah. yeah, if it's from the company, they must have given you paperwork to take it on. Oh, Mr. Mr. Mohammed just give to me. Did he, Mr. Mohammed? Yeah. Again, into the groin. They're looking for any inconsistencies that suggest the crew could be hiding something. Well, basically, uh, draft length uh, of your vessel didn't tie in. Uh, with what you're transmitting on AIS. Who is responsible on board for monitoring? Sumra, I will, I will discipline Sumra for that. He is supposed to check before we leave. He is lazy man. As the search on the bridge continues, things down on deck are getting a little tense. Stand by, stand by. Well, it's okay. There's it's no problem. Make it down on the deck. No, sit down. No, sit down. This is no problem. Give your hands on the deck. No we board ships in the Persian Gulf, in the Med, in the Atlantic all the time, and uh, we like to basically put in anything they may see out there. No, you're not hurt. Are you hurt? No, they scare me with their big gun. That's no, why I want. No, we just practice. don't want you, you to run it. away because it looks like you've something to hide. Even though it is a training exercise, we still have to treat it for real because we still have to make these kind of decisions when it's for real. So we get used to making a call when the pressure's really on when we're doing a job for real. Then we should find it a lot easier to make the call. Learns a lot more, so we can go on to bigger and better things from here. Coming up, the war game is on, but arcs down an engine. Shut down, 9JT. And a helicopter. Are we realistically going to get it on the ramp in about 10 minutes? Uh... HMS Ark Royals in the middle of a month-long war game with the US. Her four-month deployment has been building up to this event. She's been joined by the UK Amphibious Task Group and is now part of an eight-ship fleet controlled by Commodore Simon Ancona. Ark Royal is the center of a task group. It's not just a, a large mobile airfield. It is the command and control hub 
and the centre, I mean, unfairly called the Death Star, but the fact is, it is the large planet around which the moons rotate. Of course it couldn't exist without the escorts that sit around it, but Art Royal, if you like, is the hub, um, which is fantastic, because you wouldn't wish a better hub than Art Royal. But the hub's got a problem. Below decks. Engine trouble. Arcs powered by four gas turbines, based on jet engines used in aircraft. Together they produce 100,000 horsepower, the equivalent of a thousand family cars. A warning light's come on, so Arcs engineers have to act immediately and turn off the suspect engine. Start 9 mic 2 IP pump, shut down 9JT. They found the cause of the problem. Warrant Officer Billy Richman is in charge of putting it right. Well, what we have in the system is what's called magnetic chip detectors and uh, small strainers that collect debris that run through the oil system of the engine. Uh, on a 24-hour basis, we check these magnetic chip detectors to make sure there's no debris sitting on top of them. We found that we did have some debris on, on one of the chips. We then decided to take the strainers out to check the strainers, and that's when we found this amount of debris inside. It is very important that we don't have this debris in there because we could get a catastrophic failure if the oil system is blocked and unable to lubricate the engine. Without lubricant, the engine would not just break down, it would break up. Worst case scenario, all the blades would have gone up the funnel and landed on the flight deck effectively. So, all the uh, turbine blades. So it could have been pretty nasty? Yeah, for those up top. <laughs> Having one engine down, even temporarily, is a serious business, especially in the middle of a huge war game with the US military. Ark Royal can still be fairly quick. She's built to be resilient, and her three remaining engines can keep her cruising at 27 knots, only six knots below her top speed. But there's a risk. If other engines fail, Ark could slow down so much that there might not be enough headwind across the deck for the Harrier jets to take off safely. That would leave the task force with no air support. In a war, that could be catastrophic. So Ark Royal carries spares, and not just spare parts, but two entire spare engines. So it's down to these engineers to remove and replace the engine in the middle of the ocean. This team's never done it before, and it weighs two and a half thousand kilos. The man in charge of the operation is Chief Engineer Daz Heaver. This is like the defective one, and what we'll do is take this into the hangar, we we'll side by side them to take all the parts off that you need, and then we'll bring the new one back down here, and then the old one will go in the, the white kennel there, and that's where our spare engines get up there. But with air operations continuing, the engineers have to work around arc speed requirements. We've got to stop while they launch some jets. We we'll secure it in place so it's all nice and safe. And then once they've launched the jets, then that's when we're actually moving it across onto the massive trolley. With all her jets airborne, Ark slows down so the engineers can crack on. Although most of them have never changed an engine at sea before. The area they're working in is only just big enough to maneuver the faulty engine out. Then it's taken up to the hangar in its pub. The beach assault on the US East Coast is about to begin. For the purpose of the exercise, the Americans have named an area Amberland. They'll actually be heading here 
a US Navy base, Camp Lejeune. It's a 620 square kilometer military training area with a 22 kilometer long beach. It's the perfect location to practice land, sea and air assaults. Commodore Ancona is leading the task group from ARC as they move in to secure the region. You could equate, if you like, Amberland to a number of nearly failed states around the world. The important thing is that little bits of the skill sets that we, um, w which we hope to develop through this whole exercise, little chunks of those could be extremely useful almost in any situation. Everybody understands how volatile the world can be, and it's entirely possible that something like this, which is the provision and the security of humanitarian aid, could happen, um, well, tomorrow. And the ship delivering the Royal Marines and hardware ashore is HMS Albion, in charge of the Royal Navy's amphibious task group. Just as Art Royal is the hub for, for the carrier strike group, Albion is the command platform for the amphibious task group. But more than that, she's a, a landing platform dock, which means within her sits uh, you know, a, a large part of the landing force. On Albion's vehicle deck, Royal Marines from 42 Commando are getting ready for a full-scale beach landing. They're loading up the landing craft, each weighing 200 tons and capable of carrying 70 tons of equipment. Albion's stern gate opens to flood the well dock. So the landing craft carrying the Marines and their vehicles can float out into the ocean. One of the officers overseeing their exit is Assault Systems Engineer, Lieutenant Dan Parnell. This is the well dock uh, in HMS Albion. Uh, as you can see at the moment, it's currently flooded, down to a depth of around about two and a half metres. We house four landing craft utility in here at all time. And as you can see, we've got one in, in the uh, port forward lane, we'd have another one behind it, another two in the starboard lane here. The landing craft we have a design that we can take stuff off the vehicle deck, run it all the way through from one landing craft into the next. They can all be pre-loaded prior to an assault. We can go from the pre-action condition to the action condition in approximately 30 minutes, open the gate, and out they go with it in less than 30 minutes. These Royal Marines are about to put all their training into practice and storm the beaches of a US naval base. Ark Royal's in position 90 kilometers from the coast to give the Marines air support. But a problem with a Sea King helicopter could be about to compromise the security of the mission. It's unsafe to fly, but is being taken down into the hangar alongside another out-of-action Sea King. One of them should be operational at all times, providing long-range surveillance. Helicopter engineer Mark Roddy is hoping they'll be able to get this one flying today and back into the operation. First one went unserviceable on start this morning when the pilot was going through his pre-flight checks. We had a quick look at it, couldn't resolve it in the time scale to meet the second sortie, so we had to take the decision to cannibalise and swap two of the components from one onto the other. So Mark hopes to make one good helicopter from two broken ones. One of the parts is just a simple little pin. It's for the actuation of the fire extinguisher bottle for an engine. Uh, and the other one is a data processor. We try to avoid it wherever we can because for obvious reasons it doubles the maintenance effort. But in essence, making another aircraft unserviceable to get a flyer. We need to be airborne by 11 to fit in with the jets. Uh, we're at 9.15 at the moment. As you can see, the work conditions are far from ideal. It's hot, it's humid, it's sweaty. The engineers will need to work fast to swap over the data processor and the pin from the fire extinguisher from one helicopter to the other. This tiny little threaded portion here is the bit that's sheared. Um, and what happens, this fits to the fire extinguisher bottle. Inside we have an explosive cartridge, which is what initiates the the extinction to fire into the engine if there's a fire. And this portion here is where we attach the electrical cable to initiate the charge. And because that is sheared, we can't have any confidence in the continuity of the charge into the, uh, the banger, as we call it, the cartridge, uh, and hence the fire extinction system on the engine would be an operative. Uh, 
which is why we're having to change this assembly over to the other aircraft to make it serviceable. How are we getting on time scale wise? Are we, uh, are we realistically going to get it on the ramp in about 10 15 minutes? Uh, to get eight sets going, just to be to not happy to put it on the ramp, on the lift. Half an hour, 45 minutes. It took a day just to get that pipeline off. If he does it in half an hour, that's going to be 20 past 10 on the lift. Yeah. If we can get that up on the lift and straight onto the spot, that gives them 10 minutes to get spotted, which might give them time to go on it or 25 to. If Ark was engaged in war rather than a war game, the entire mission might now rest on the shoulders of these engineers. Coming up. The Marines storm the beaches, but have trouble getting home. HMS Ark Royal is leading the Auriga task force in a huge war game against the US Navy. Ark's role is to provide air support to the rest of the task group. especially the assault ship HMS Albion, which is launching her Royal Marines into a beach landing and invasion. But a problem with a Sea King helicopter has left Ark Royal blind beyond the horizon. The engineers need to get her airborne quickly and have been plundering parts from another faulty helicopter so she can take up her crucial surveillance role in the skies. And after a frantic struggle, she finally gets up and away. The Royal Marines rely on the intelligence that our helicopters can gather. They rely on the ability of the Harriers to support them, either by striking targets or, again, by generating um, in intelligence for them. Uh, and, and that, as I see, the most important role out here is, A, to protect the amphibious task group as a whole, but also to provide that vital support for the Marines ashore. And this is where they'll be landing. Intelligence from ARC is radioed to the troops. Assisting the operation on the ground is Sergeant Guy Kenavan from 6 Assault Squadron. What we've got today is a series of what's called uh, wader drills, where we put the troops through different uh, scenarios of getting ashore of various, uh, various different craft that we use. We've got 120 guys at the moment, which is a company strength and they're rotating through each stance, you know, throughout the afternoon. So they get a taste of, uh, of, of a method of insertion on, on each of the various craft that we use. And this hovercraft is one of them, the Grifton 2000 TD. It's got a powerful diesel engine capable of lifting its three and a half ton hull and pushing it along at 30 knots. It can get right up onto a beach. It can operate on very, very shallow gradient beaches that other landing craft can't actually get into. And it can deliver troops ashore, dry and fit and ready to fight. 90 kilometres out to sea, Ark Royal's floating runway is as busy as it gets. Her job is to protect the ships that make up the task force and support the Marines from attack on the shore. The Sea King will spot any threats from incoming ships, planes or missiles. The Lynx is on hand as a gun platform in the sky while the Harriers can take out any target deemed a threat by Marines on the ground. The Carrier Strike Group, centred around Art Royal, is coordinating the protection over a vast area outside and away from the coast. We're now concentrating on supporting the Royal Marines ashore. And they've gone ashore, they've established themselves, they've had a look at the problem, they've had to secure certain areas, and they've used um, everything from persuasion through key leadership engagement. You can teach them how to use a gun or something. So we are not a training force. Uh, we are not a force that is here to take sides. But also having taken direct action to overcome the challenges they've got. And we've helped them in that in that we've provided um, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, but also kinetic strike as well. So we're, when it's been required, we've hit, we've hit targets. The, 
The beach landing exercise over, the Marines are heading back to their ships. But the weather's changed abruptly. The sea that was placid this morning has turned angry. And one of the landing craft trying to get back to Albion is in trouble. The waves are overwhelming her, and she's starting to take on water with 35 Marines on board. Ark Royal's helicopters are a 45-minute flight away, and Albion can't move with her well dock flooded. So the Marines are on their own. She makes slow progress against the swell. But finally, gets back to the protection of the mothership and into the dock. Just coming in, the waves are starting to, uh, to get a, uh, a little bit sporty. We're starting to, to sway around quite a lot, so sea state was just starting to pick up too much. Well, we got all the guys out, started bailing, so we just about kept it under control. But it was a little bit exciting for a while. A team gets to work with pumps. The cabin of the lander shows that the Marines had quite a close call. Inside the boat, it was absolute pandemonium. Waves were breaking sort of up to waist height on occasions. Yeah, we were slamming at times, bouncing up and down in the cabin. Water was coming in through the roof, which was, uh, was novel. Got up to about six inches, crept onto a foot, and we were like, right, you know, we really need to take action here. So, yeah, we, we bailed like nobody's business, um, sort of teams of two, buckets saucepan, you name it, everything, um, and throwing as much water out as possible. We drove for that dock, and all credit to the crew, actually, they drove us straight in, no fuss, didn't hit the side or anything, um, and we were very, very relieved. Ark Royal is continuing the war game. The Harriers have been dispatched to take care of some hostile jets. They're hunting down American F-18s that are threatening the task group. Bridget but communications come into the flight control room that one of the jets has suffered an electrical problem and has been forced to make an emergency landing on a US airbase. All right, OK, thanks, mate. Oh, OK. Words passed down to Flight Lieutenant Will Collins the on-duty squadron authoriser. Whilst he was repositioning in between a fight, his generator tripped offline. His generator is the main supplier of electrical power to the aircraft running off the engine. Um, so as you can imagine, in a modern electrical jet, that runs an awful lot of the systems. It's junior engineer Andy Fielder's job to coordinate the rescue. 60 miles, going to take the guys, maybe an hour in the Merlin. I'll go away, get the team together um, and get back to you. We need to get a team um, to the diversion as soon as possible. Um, we need to get the right team uh, with the right stores, with the right tooling, in order to fix whichever snag um, has, has come up. And they'll need to hurry. Ark won't be in helicopter range for long, and she can't break away from the deployment to rescue one jet. We're sort of 60, 60 miles off, uh, off land at the moment, but in a couple of days' time, we could be, could be anywhere. Really. And this is where Jet 26A is stranded. Naval Air Station Oceana in Virginia. One of the largest and most advanced air bases in the world. The pilot is Flight Lieutenant Martin Pert. We were doing 2v2 dissimilar air combat, so we were fighting F-18s based out of here in Oceana. Uh, and they were intercepting us, and we were actually doing some dogfighting with them. We'd rolled out from one of our fights. Uh, everything had sort of gone calm. All the electrical power in the jet died. All of the computer screens went completely blank and um, all the radios went quiet. As soon as the radios go dead, you do feel kind of a bit alone and, and afraid up there. 
all the maps uh, and all the computer displays have completely disappeared. So it's back to the old fashioned looking at the map, using a stopwatch, looking at the ground features and actually trying to establish exactly where I am. So actually bringing it back to the aircraft carrier without a head-up display, without all of the normal instruments that we have, and probably isn't the wisest uh, option, which is why I decided to come um, onto land here at Oceana, which has got a, a 9,000 foot long runway, which I can put it down on with no hassles. And it's not the first time this particular Harry has let Martin down. I'm fairly well jinxed on this detachment. Uh, last week I had a tank overpressure, which uh, is a fairly serious emergency in a, in a plastic winged aircraft like the Harrier. So uh, I had to step ashore again to Greenwood's um, Canadian Air Force Base, uh, and that was all of six, six nights ago. So this is my second time ashore in a week. Fortunately, this time, Martin doesn't have to wait too long. Lieutenant Fielder's engineering team has arrived from Arc Royal, along with the part they're hoping will get this Harrier airborne. Lead engineer Chris Smith finds out from Martin exactly what's happened. We're here to diagnose the fault and change the part that we need, uh, which in this case is the variable speed constant frequency generator. The way it works is that it's actually attached to the gearbox of the engine. So no matter what speed the engine's turning, this thing is producing a very rough and ready electrical signal. We use large transistors inside of this generator to generate a whole new smooth electrical signal that's capable of powering all of the sensitive equipment from the multiple systems within the aeroplane. The temperature on the tarmac is well above 40 degrees. These guys are going to be working now for about three to three and a half hours, changing the generator, after which the functional tests are pretty quick, so hopefully within three and a half hours, uh, Martin will be good to go. Most people working on a ship for a long period of time love an unexpected run ashore, but for Martin, this is one too many. Yeah, I mean, it is a nice break from the norm, and obviously we're here you know, on land and not on the, uh, the carrier, which is a privilege that not many of the guys get. Um, but it is quite frustrating. You know, we're just kind of at the mercies of uh, the engineering teams here at Oceana. Um, at, you know, we're sort of relying on communications to and from the aircraft carrier, which can be sometimes quite difficult. You know, when they're on manoeuvres and uh, exercising, it can be quite hard to get hold of them. The generator's finally fitted. The next stage is to top it up with oil. The engineers have now got to make haste. There's a helicopter waiting to take them back to the Ark before she sails out of flying range. The jet's powered up and tested. Jet 26A has let him down again. Martin could be stuck here for days. Coming up. Pam, 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 over Commando 1. It's code red as a helicopter declares an emergency miles from land. We have got seven on board. That's a land as soon as possible emergency for us. It's been a hectic few weeks for the crew of Ark Royal, as they've led the Auriga task group in war games against the US Navy. It's the biggest exercise the Royal Navy's undertaken for a decade. It's not always about, you know, having a three-hour exercise, everyone gets terribly excited, we do what we have to do, then collapse it and pat ourselves on the back. You've got to be able to sustain this for a long time. And, and Ark Royal and the other ship's companies in the group you know, it's about monotony management as, as well as being ready to fight when you're required to fight. And so keeping that effort going, keeping the ships going, and being able to be there when required in itself is quite wearing, and the ships are doing fabulously. ARC's role is to protect the rest of the task group by offering air support with her helicopters and fast jets. She's holding the position off the US East Coast, safeguarding the rest of the fleet, including HMS Ocean, a purpose-built helicopter carrier and part of the amphibious task group. But one of Ocean... And now he's on the ground. He knows he made the right decision. Any faults involving the drivetrain down to the tower road are potentially very bad. Uh, if you 
especially in the hover, if you lose uh, tower rotor drive, you're crashing. Um, but the reason we've got those chip detectors, basically they detect very, very small particles of metal in the oil. So when those go off, you know something's going wrong. It's a 45 minute transit back to uh, shore, which is not ideal when you've got a, a potential emergency. You want to get it down as soon as you can. And obviously you can't run and land into the sea, because it generally doesn't work out quite so well. Having a deck available is really what you need. It's always nice to land somewhere where you can get out, walk out and have a cup of tea afterwards, rather than to end up bobbing around in your little orange boat, hoping someone comes and picks you up. Ark's engineers get straight on the job. And in a couple of hours, they've discovered what's wrong. It's the same problem Ark had a while ago with her engine, metal fatigue. But we've just found quite a large amount of uh, uh, ferrous material. It shows that the gear teeth in the intermediate gearbox are losing their material. That gearbox was to lose uh, a lot of material, then actually that gearbox could potentially fail. There's quite a lot of material, so we'll be looking at a gearbox change. While ARC's engineers set about getting this Sea King back in the air, another invalided aircraft appears on the horizon. But this one's repaired. It's Jet 26A. It's got 9661 flight, South Flight Call. Good afternoon and welcome. We're joined for the whole week. The repair took a full day longer than Martin had hoped. But he's relieved to be back to rejoin his squadron. Today to get it serviceable again. Uh, we're in a position this morning that we can get airborne uh, safely, transit the 200 miles here to the aircraft carrier. So that was sort of two days miss, you know, two days of, of flying that we lost, two days sitting on the ground at Oceana, which, um, although it's a nice break from the, from the ship, it's, um, it is quite frustrating being, being on land there. After a smooth 320 kilometer flight back to Ark, Martin is hoping he's left the curse of Jet 26A behind him. She's fine, yeah, absolutely perfect. No, no foibles whatsoever. So um, maybe we've uh, maybe we've made up, uh, you know, made amends with each other. Next time on HMS Ark Royal. Action station. That's what we do on Thursdays. We go to war. Advance. That's it. Everyone's gone. We are in a deployment. Less than 24 hours from home. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah.